Hello, my name's Ed Frawley. I own Learberg. Here's another question and answer that we got by, uh, by email off of our website. We get them every single day. We answer them all in a timely fashion, and we keep the good ones like this. Uh, I'll read this because it's a question about remote callers and prong callers. Uh, it's from Travis. He says, I've been doing a lot of research on training my dog. I've watched many of your videos. My question is, is the e-collar training seen as a replacement for prong collars or popping the collar training? Do you have a preference? Is there something specific I should consider when deciding on which of the two types of training to use? Really good question. Really good question. Uh, let me first start by talking about prong collars. Uh, I have, I sell a lot of prong collars, and I've trained a lot of dogs in the last 50 years with prong collars. And I have to say that, and people hate me because I've shown people in our training videos how to use prong collars. Prong collars, when they are used incorrectly, are not a good training tool. If you use a prong collar on a aggressive dog, you could very easily make him more aggressive because they overstimulate with a prong collar correction and they can turn and come back onto the handler. I know, I've had it happen to me in the past. Prong collar corrections on nervous or hectic dogs can make them more nervous and more hectic because they don't understand it, especially when it's a beginner using it that doesn't understand good timing and doesn't understand what level of correction is needed to change the dog's behavior. Most of the time, if I have an option on using a collar and I'm at the level in training to use a correction, and that's an important caveat, uh, I would prefer most of the time to use a dominant dog collar, these slip collars that we sell. You can go to our website and, and use the search engine, Dominant Dog Collar. The web address is learberg.com forward slash 746.htm. A dominant dog collar does not make an aggressive dog more aggressive. It doesn't make uh, a hectic dog more hectic if it's used properly. And it's explained on our website how to do this. Now, should you use that versus a remote collar. Let's just generalize this and talk about corrections. We, don't, we consider ourselves balanced dog trainers, and what is that? That's a, someone that trains motivationally. They, we take our dogs through uh, the learning phase of behaviors with motivational methods. We use marker training. We make our dogs generalize the behavior motivationally and generalization simply means we teach the dog that if you're a new dog trainer and you've never trained a dog before, you're gonna find out, hey, I train my dog to sit in the kitchen. If I turn around and ask him to sit, they don't sit, they just look at me. If I take my dog in the backyard, he won't sit. That's because the dog hasn't generalized the behavior yet. So we generalize behaviors motivationally. We don't take a dog out in the backyard or to the park that we think the dog knows the meaning of sitting down and he doesn't do it in the park and we correct him for that, that's wrong. Generalize the behavior motivationally in different environments under different distractions and do it motivationally. Once a dog has generalized the behavior, and we are 100% sure of that, and we take the dog out and he's faced with a distraction when he knows what we're asking and we say no, come, and he doesn't come, then we add corrections to it. And then how do you add corrections? You know, a lot of people prefer to use a leash correction. That's how you start. And then we add uh, remote collar training to that. So to answer your question is make sure your dog generalizes the behavior. If the dog generalizes behavior, and you have to correct the dog to change that behavior, you have to determine what level of correction to use with a leash to change that behavior. What collar you use depends on what kind of dog you have. 
back on prong collars, we prefer the small little bitty link prong collars rather than the medium or extra large prong collars. If you see competition dog people train dogs with prong collars, they're all the little bitty ones. The reason for that is it takes much less pressure with one of these little collars to get the dog to change their behavior than it does with the big ones. I mean, they look like medieval torture tools, which is the reason that a lot of people that lack experience don't like them. But if they're used correctly, it takes very little pressure from them to change the behavior on a dog. Uh, the example is uh, a couple weeks ago, we have a two-year-old border terrier named Stella. She's never had a prong collar on. She's always been walked on our bike path uh, with a flat collar. So we took her out, and when we walk her before with a flat collar, every person, every dog she meets is her best friend in the world, and she knows they want to play with her. So she, when we see her, people on the bike trail, she's on her back feet trying to get to them to play with them. Enough is enough. We put a, uh, one of the mini prongs on her. There was no correction at all. She pulled into the leash, and it was a different dog. Never had to give her a leash correction. So if you're going to use a prong collar, let the dog self-correct into it for whatever behavior you're doing. If you have to give it a correction, you give it one that fits the temperament, the drive, and what's in the dog's head at that moment. And that's what the le you need to give them a correction strong enough to change that behavior. Once the dog is used to getting a correction with the prong or with the dominant dog collar, then you pair it with a remote collar. A remote collar is absolutely the best training tool that's ever been devised. It's also the most abused training tool that's ever been devised. We train with low level stimulation. Go back and read some of the old Q&As. The level of stimulation we use, a lot of times, humans can't even feel. They can't feel it, it's just a tingle. I tell people when they get a new remote collar, put it on themselves. Start at zero, turn it up, push the button. Turn it up, push the button. Turn it up, push the button. Look for the part, look for the spot where you just barely feel a slight tingle. This is not a shock, it's a tingle. That's the level, if we were going to train you with a remote collar, that's the level we would start to train with. And we do the same thing with the dog. We put the collar on, we look for the first point where he just blinks his eyes or twitches his ear or looks at the ground like he just stepped on something. That's the level we start with. And a lot of the times, dogs never have to go beyond and above that. Once a dog is trained with a remote collar, what you'll find is if you do the training right, very, very seldom do you ever have to use that collar again. We, now, I should say that, there's a caveat. Very, very seldom do you have to use the transmitter again. When I was a police canine handler for 10 years, every time I deployed, my dog wore a remote collar. And I handled multiple dogs over that 10 year period. The interesting thing was, they were trained before I took them out with it, and I will I used the number of, you know, maybe once in 20 deployments, I would have to push that button. Quite frankly, very seldom on deployments did I ever have to do it. And I think if you introduce your dog to remote collars correctly, you'll find the same thing. So the answer to your question here is you use them both. But you use the one that's appropriate for your dog and you only correct to the level to change behaviors. That's the purpose of a correction, to change a behavior.